Okay, folks, let's get going. So a practical today on neural networks. I will give you a bit of an introduction into what all of that is. And then we'll spend a couple of hours training a basic neural network that solves a mathematical problem that is otherwise difficult because it's ill-posed and unstable. But first, uh, about 40 minutes of the algebra that takes place behind all the newspaper hypes that you've seen on the television. So why are we here? Why did the AI revolution suddenly happen last year, this year or thereabouts? Even though the basic building blocks like perceptrons and neural networks have been around since the 1990s. The principal reason is that the computing power has arrived of the kind that makes those networks actually achieve the dramatic results that we all see. This is the top 500 supercomputers list. Uh, that's the weakest, that's the strongest, that's the total in gigaflops, so a billion floating point operations in double precision per second, logarithmic y-axis as a function of the year. And you can see it's pretty much exponential and has been exponential for the last 30 years. Now, to put things in context a little bit here, when I was starting my PhD around about 2002, so the strongest supercomputer in, uh, on Earth was a couple of teraflop FP64, so the ASCII Red supercomputer, two football fields of Pentium Pros. Now, in 2024, um, a single NVIDIA uh, motherboard costs about 200,000 pounds, is several times stronger than that. So a single GPU these days, so 30 teraflops or so, double precision, is stronger than the United States military had been around 2000 or thereabouts, and admittedly it is probably, it was probably more efficient back then than it is now. So we have seen giant supercomputers move from national facilities into pretty literally your laptop. And this is why everything started suddenly working. That's the top GPU supercomputers. Uh, you can see the installations that there are are just completely dominated by NVIDIA. This is not necessarily hardware. You can find pieces of hardware at AMD, at Cerebrus and elsewhere, which is nominally technically faster, but what makes NVIDIA dominant by a mile is the outstanding software around it, CUDA libraries and such like, because a significant chunk of that is communication, parallelization, scheduling, data management, memory management, and so on. And so they pretty much cornered the market. And then, of course, you've seen all of this hype. You take some ancient piece of statistics and you republish it as machine learning. We have it in chemistry as much uh, as anywhere else. A significant amount of work that, you know, people have fitted a straight line to a bunch of points as, oh, we have machine learned the parameters. That's nonsense, of course, right? There's a big difference between um, the actual large scale artificial intelligence work and what used to be known as chemometrics and statistics. Uh, then uh, closer home, right, in magnetic resonance, uh, this is what I do for a living in magnetic resonance imaging. Of course, there are plenty of papers about resolution enhancement where you take a low-res image of somebody's brain fitted to a neural network and it produces a high-res image. Well, the shrewd journalists have taken a picture, pixelated picture of Barack Obama and fed it into the resolution enhancement neural network and it enhanced the resolution which of course immediately begs the question about what would happen if this were MRI of your brain, right? how many features that weren't there would it actually hallucinate? Right? So one has to take all those claims with a pinch of salt. And then if you take that uh, NVIDIA multi-module, um, I've just bought one for the lab, in fact, it's arriving next month. Uh, it's about 250 teraflop. If you multiply it by a month, you get one millimole of multiplication. <coughs> And so by the time we start measuring multiplications in millimoles, you can see that computational chemistry pretty much has arrived, right? We are close to the thermodynamic limits 
of what is necessary for us to converge our various ensembles. But okay, let's go back to biology and let us retrace the steps that the people in the 40s, 1940s, that started modeling these systems have walked when they arrived at what we these days use as artificial neural networks. So we've got some chemists. The chemists can relax. The physicists probably haven't seen any of that. Uh, but that's a schematic of a human neuron. It has uh, the primary body, uh, which is responsible for metabolism and such like, called the soma. Then it has dendrites um, that are in contact with other neurons and are spread around it. And a particularly long dendrite called axon with specialized electrical isolation cells around it called Schwann cells. And then the axon has terminals which touch the dendrites of other neurons around it. And if we look closer at the membrane of these cells, we will see the usual construction, you know, the double layer, the various proteins, uh, the various glycoproteins, glycolipids and such like, little bit of structural uh, filaments underneath it. But what would strike us as odd about specifically neuron membranes is the abundance of ion channels and ion pumps in it. And if we do some electrophysiology on it, the first thing we realize is that inside and outside mammalian neurons, the concentrations of sodium and potassium are very, very different, which is strange for something that is chemically so similar. In particular, inside the neuron, we would have pretty high concentration, 140 millimolar concentration of potassium, but very little of it on the outside. Reciprocally, we would have rather little sodium on the inside, but quite a lot of it on the outside, which is why the table salt is sodium chloride, right? If you eat too much potassium chloride, you're not going to be very well, but you can eat as much sodium chloride as you want. That's because plenty of it in the extracellular medium, and in fact, uh, we wouldn't particularly mind if there's a little bit more. So, giant concentration gradients across this membrane. Well, what do they cause? Well, obviously, if we work through the, electric, um, the thermodynamics of electric charges in there, these concentration gradients, they generate transmembrane electrostatic potential. And uh, the actual difference in potential across the membrane is not terribly big. It's 60 millivolts or so. However, of course, this membrane is only, you know, dozens of nanometers across. And so if we divide millivolts by nanometers, we get megavolts per meter. There is a monstrous electric field across the membranes of neurons. And why do we want six megavolts per meter? And why would the cell work so hard uh, to do that? And uh, why would we need uh, 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses? Well, let's take a look. Firstly, let's find out how this colossal concentration gradient and this colossal electric field is actually maintained and what that means for the neuron signal transduction. And then we start modeling those things. So firstly, how the gradient is actually generated. We have ATP-dependent transmembrane ion pumps. A um, piece of ATP binds to that pump and three equivalents of sodium. Now, ATP is cleaved, the resulting energy goes into the change of conformation of this pump. It closes on the in inner side, opens on the outer side. Uh, two units of potassium are bound into the pockets here and three units of sodium are released on the outside. And then the last phosphate bond is cleaved uh, so the phosphate is released, the conformation changes again, and two equivalents of potassium are released into the intracellular medium. Well, the first thing that does, of course, is it drives this transmembrane gradient. Sodium ends up on the outside, potassium on the inside, and second, you can see the charge imbalance, right? Three units of charge came out, two units of charge came in. This is what's driving that colossal electric field across the membrane. And in fact, uh, this process consumes most of the energy budget of the neuron. Now, apart from the pumps, there are also channels, uh, which are normally blocked. But if something comes and drops that transmembrane voltage somewhat, these channels open. Of course, the predictable thing happens is that 
some ions rush in and as soon as that transmembrane potential drops further there is a conformation change again there's a little plug that plugs the channel so what would all of that do if we look at the time dynamics of this process all these pumps and all these channels what's going to happen so here we are sitting at the minus 60 millivolts and if a perturbation arrives that drops this potential to minus 40, what happens is the voltage-gated sodium channels open in response to this voltage drop. So, open channel, lots of sodium on the outside, the sodium's going to rush in, of course, that would reduce the transmembrane potential even more. So we go to zero and even into reverse polarity briefly because there's so much sodium on the outside. Now as soon as there's reverse polarity these voltage-gated potassium channels open and the sodium-gated channels close. Uh, sodium channels close. So potassium, there's plenty of it on the inside, that rushes out and of course that takes the positive charge back out and so transmembrane potential is restored and can even overshoot the original polarization level and so this process continues until we've restored this polarization then this channel is blocked as well and we go back into the resting state so we've got this spike of ionic currents across the membrane of the neuron and the result, interestingly, is a traveling wave. If we have our axon and we had a depolarization event here, it would trigger the depolarization event next door, it would trigger it next door, it would trigger it next door. And so what you have is a traveling depolarization wave across the axon. And this is how neural signals... Yes? What, how come it goes only to the left and not left? It would, it would go both. Uh, so what you have is a traveling wave um, and this is in fact how signal is propagated um, through our nervous system. They are not electric currents, they are ionic currents and they happen perpendicular to the axon and what is really traveling is the membrane depolarization wave. And of course, that travels significantly slower than electric currents, right? Typically, wavefront velocity in copper wire is two-thirds of the speed of light, whereas the rate of travel for this membrane depolarization wave, depending on the organism and the conditions, is between one and a hundred meters per second. So you can see we as uh, biological species are already at a four orders of magnitude disadvantage relative to any creatures that would actually be using electrical currents for the signal propagation. Okay, so this membrane depolarization wave eventually arrives to the end of the axon and there are voltage-gated calcium channels at these terminals that cause um, synaptic vesicles containing a chemical neurotransmitter to come to the surface and rupture. They release a neurotransmitter to, uh, into the synaptic cleft. It binds to uh, ligand-gated ion channels. They cause depolarization on the other side. And so the depolarization wave continues on to the next neuron. So we've got uh, these uh, ligand, chemical ligand-gated ion channels as a result. And so what is happening in total is depolarization waves are arriving to a particular neuron from every direction. It takes a look at its own depolarization. If it has exceeded a certain threshold, it sends the depolarization wave down the axon. So what is happening here is the incoming signals are received, added up somehow, and there is a nonlinear activation function that does nothing if you're below the threshold and does something if you are above the threshold. So a neuron, in, the, in other words, collects, moderates and processes electrical signals and then passes a signal on if they exceed a certain threshold. Okay, uh, we're now in 1943, where Warren McCulloch and company have been looking at the ways to model this mathematically. What they knew is what I just told you, that a neuron collects, moderates and passes on depolarization signals. They said, well, okay, they will arrive through these dendrites. Why don't we put some numbers to 
uh, denote the amplitude of the arriving signal. Different dendrites here would be differently sensitive to the incoming signals. Why don't we multiply these numbers by the corresponding weights? Neurophysiologists also knew that different neurons are differently biased, so differently primed to fire in the event of a depolarization event incoming. And so we need to add a little bit of bias in here. And then uh, we will model this nonlinear response by some activation function. If we are below a threshold, nothing happens. If we are above the threshold, the signal is being passed on. Well, let's make a mathematical function out of this. We've got the inputs, we've got the weights, that's the total sum, that's the bias, that's the activation function, that's the output. The physicists will already recognize the inner product on the real space. So that's a vector of weights times the vector of inputs uh, plus a number through a function and on the output. Okay, if we now have multiple neurons in a layer, what is going to happen is we will have multiple entities like that. So the vector goes in, right, and then gets multiplied by the weight vectors of the individual neurons, right? And if you've got a weight vector here, weight vector here, weight vector here, well, that's a matrix, right? It's a matrix vector multiplication. So what we are going to see is neuron 1, neuron 2, neuron 3, and so on, all receiving the same inputs. This W transpose is a row vector, another row vector, another row vector, so concatenate them. That's a matrix called a weight matrix. The input goes in, each individual neuron would have a different bias, so we concatenate these numbers and get the bias vector. And then we have the element-wise activation function that would then produce as element-wise the output. So the mathematical model of a layer of such neurons is vector goes in times a matrix plus a vector through a function vector on the output. Okay. But look at it, this is linear algebra and element-wise mathematical operations, they are really perfect for GPUs. And this is why the artificial intelligence really took off when GPUs have arrived. But notice here that the structure of this argument requires the dimension of x to be fixed. If you have an x of the wrong dimension, it wouldn't match this weight matrix. And so later we would have to find a way of generalizing this somehow to the inputs that have indeterminate lengths or uh, variable lengths as a function of time, for example. Now, the reason why this ended up so successful emerged in 1989, where an astounding theorem was proved that uh, these, uh, the networks of such objects are universal approximators, that is, for any arithmetical or logical function and for any finite accuracy, there is a finite network of such objects that would output that function to that accuracy, uh, which is really a, an incredibly general statement and it possibly explains why you and I have evolved as neural networks other than Turing machines, for example. Question? No. Okay. Well, then we can put those layers one after the other. So that's the input um, tectum goes into that neuron, that neuron, that neuron, through the function, into the next layer of neurons, into the next layer of neurons. And this is what neural networks are made of, just connected layers of neurons, and output of the previous layer goes into the next one. Thus, vector goes in, times a matrix, plus a vector, through a function, times a matrix, plus a vector, through a function, times a matrix, plus a vector, through a function, on the output. Congratulations, you know everything there is to know about artificial intelligence. So everything else are just meshes and networks and combinations and sequences of this one elementary operation. There's really very little else. And of course, here these weight matrices and the bias vectors are unknown. And so we need to find a way of determining them. And that's called training. And that's, of course, case specific. And this is our next topic. So how would we train a neural network? And we are now in round about 1970s. Well, let's take one neuron as a simple case and find out how do we get these Ws and the B. Well, we presumably have a big collection of 
inputs alongside the known right answer. That's called the training database. And then, well, how do we find that? Well, why don't we set up some error functional? That's our network. That's the output. That's the right answer. So the output of the network minus the right answer squared, least squares, right, fitting, sum over the training database. If this number is small, the network is doing good. If the number is large, we need to improve it. How do we minimize this number? Gradient descent. So straightforward minimization process. D uh, error functional by D weight matrix, for example. Uh, this is a, a, a vector value derivative, but essentially just the gradient, right? Uh, and then we step down that gradient with some cleverly chosen step, and the next um, value here would, um, if it's small enough and everything behaves itself, result in the W being smaller than it had been. Essentially, neural network training is just glorified least squares fitting of the neural network parameters against the database. Uh, and uh, that needs to be implemented pretty efficiently in order to work, and that was Seppeli Nainma's master's thesis ages ago. So if you're now PhD students, you're somewhat behind the curve uh, on what can be done in a master's thesis, right? You can invent backpropagation. And so uh, what he did was to say, okay, you've got a random initialization, so random initial values for them, cleverly chosen in various ways, I will not cover them. That goes into our model, the inputs go in, so we feed them forward through the network, we calculate this loss function, we differentiate, and then use the chain rule to push the derivatives back through all those nested functions, and we get the gradients with respect to the parameters of that neural network in an efficient way, both storage efficient and communication efficient and compute efficient. And uh, well, we need a training set for a typical neural network these days. You need millions and billions of question-answer pairs because there will be millions of billions and billions of parameters to determine. Even for the tiny neural networks that we train in physical sciences for data processing, we needed 10 to the 10 question-answer pairs to train the networks that you will be looking at later today. And then we need a validation set that the network hasn't seen before in order to evaluate its performance and its ability to generalize outside the literal database that it has. And of course, you can imagine uh, the difficulty here. You have to do lots and lots of matrix vector algebra repeatedly for millions of vectors and millions of parameters. Uh, GPUs are essential for that stuff, right? It is not realistic to train a neural network even on modern CPUs. You really need these two, three orders of magnitude that GPUs provide. And of course, I've skipped uh, you know, a few books worth of thorny numerical technicalities and stability considerations and finite precision considerations and memory allocation and, and so on. And of course, the various details of how this step is chosen. So um, books have been published on the subject. Okay, now this was vector in, vector out. Okay, for spectroscopy, for example, if you've got some fixed length signal coming in and some fixed length signal coming out, but what if the data is time dependent, right? What if it's stock price? What if it's some real time output, uh, acoustic, for example, or electromagnetic that comes out of some instrument? Well, we can try and say, okay, uh, we can make this recurrent uh, layer where there is some time dependent input and there is a second signaling line that just loops. And if we unroll that loop, okay, the first vector comes in into the uh, neural network. The first vector comes out, but it passes another vector on and then subsequent layers, they consume not one vector, but two. And that's easy to arrange. You just put them one under the other and increase the dimension of the corresponding matrices. Uh, this was attempted, but unfortunately it quickly became clear that long-range time dependencies in the data are not well reproduced by such architectures, and the training process is exceedingly slow in this case. 
So the next uh, step up, and we are now in the 90s, was to try and make a specific architecture that has a memory vector that is updated and passed on, and then the data vector that is updated and passed on. And uh, this we will need for transformers later, because this is, um, you know, what led to it. So let's take a closer look at what is happening in here. And you will see repeated appearance of exactly the same arithmetic that we have just discussed for a single neural network layer. Okay, so we have here our uh, module, so a single layer of that LSTM, and it has a memory line, uh, and memory contains a vector, and it has a data line. So that is the data line from the previous layer, and that is the vector that comes in, right, the signal at a particular time. Well, what do we do? We just concatenate them vertically, one under the other. We feed them in, they get multiplied by the weight matrix plus the bias vector through a sigmoidal activation function. You can instantly see the same good old neural network layer that McCulloch has invented back in the day. And this is called forget gate because what is going to happen here is that the output of this layer will be multiplied into the memory line element by element. So whatever small elements come out of here will destroy the corresponding elements in the memory line. And if something's big, it will amplify those elements. And so we have here uh, a, a way of multiplicatively destroying or amplifying pre-existing data in the memory line. Okay, let's take a look at the input gate. So we receive that input we send it through another sigmoidal layer, right? And it's exactly the same architecture, but of course this matrix and that vector may be different. And then this is the hyperbolic tangent, which can be both positive and negative. And so again, a different uh, weight matrix and a different activation vector. And then we do element by element multiplication. So that is the moderated input that can be positive and negative. And that's the input gate, which might just suppress the undesired parts of input if it doesn't like them because it's a multiplicative operation. Now, all of that goes additively into the memory line. So this was the multiplicative update of the memory. This is the additive update on the memory. And so after the multiplicative and the additive stages, we have the internal state update. So whatever had been there in the memory line has now been updated and can be used. And the final stage here, so we put the input through another such layer then we moderate the memory line through the hyperbolic tangent and we multiply one element wise by the other. And that is what we are passing on and also sending out as the output at this particular stage. So in summary, what we are seeing here is exactly the same neural network layer operation here, here, here and here, just arranged in a fancy way that philosophically might work the way we expect it to. So this would be uh, a layer that has some internal structure and a certain amount of memory. Well, uh, that was attempted. Turned out that parallelization is a problem. And of course, modern computer architectures are all massively parallel. So that is serious. Training was all still pretty slow. And once again, very long range dependencies could not be reproduced. And so the community conclusion uh, closer to the 2000s had been that this is also a dead end. And that was this giant quiet period in artificial intelligence between 2000 and about 2015, where development was going on, but nothing much was happening. And then Nvidia turned up. Uh, and a few other things that we will now explore. So, as you know, the latest and greatest stuff that really makes the headline is Transformers. But before we go there, we need to do a few more introductions. Firstly, of course, the input of large language models is language, collection of words, not numbers. 
it is something that does not have a set fixed length. So how do we um, digitize, as it were, how do we turn a phrase into a vector? How do we turn language into a vector space? This is called embedding. So what we do is we pick a particular dimension of our vector space, a mm, couple of million uh, is generally these days uh, the aspiration, but let's say the dimension four. And in that dimension, we will pick vectors, and I'm just denoting them here as little colored squares. And we associate a word with a vector, and another word with another vector, and another word with another vector. And let us see what we can achieve that. Can we set up some similarity metric? What can we do? Well, we can, for example, uh, embed into a vector space the set of all people. We can say, okay, person A has blue eyes, has this height, has this weight, has uh, that length of hair, uh, and so on. So we encode the various trays into the elements of a vector. Person 2, person 3, that creates us a set of old people that is mapped into a set of parameters. But then, of course, similarity metrics on vector spaces and distance metrics, they can apply, right? You can even, if it's a good embedding, you can do some linear arithmetic and it would approximately work. Uh, with a good enough embedding, you can take the vector of a king, subtract the man, add a woman, and you get a decent approximation to the vector that encodes a queen. This is, of course, a triviality, right? We don't rely on this sort of approximate additive arithmetic, but it does exist. And then, if we have a set of trays, then the inner product, as you know, is a measure of overlap, right? It's a measure of similarity. As soon as you have an inner product, by definition, you have a norm. As soon as you have a norm, you have a metric vector space. And so suddenly we've set up the metric. Suddenly it's a Hilbert space, right? And we know everything about Hilbert spaces. And so this, in fact, is the first stage of all of those fancy latest neural networks. AlphaFold embeds protein sequences, uh, LLMs like ChatGPT embed words and sequences of these vectors, and they're of course much longer dimensional than three or four, are inputs into the transformers. Now, that was actually done by linguists ages ago in 1957, and you could reasonably argue that Moses uh, in 1300 before current era has invented something similar because in Jewish Kabbalah you associate every letter with a number and words are number sequences. And so the earliest example of embedding in fact comes from Moses himself. And so probably what he heard on Mount Sinai was actually linear algebra, he just misunderstood the whole thing. Uh, but anyway, we've just mapped our language, our set of whatever non-numerical input we might have through this embedding process into a vector space, and we're really good with vector spaces. Right. The next important thing, and that's 2017, is the attention mechanism. And um, that's the funny thing, because <coughs> previously, right, the most highly cited paper in the history of science was from chemistry. It was the B3 lip exchange correlation functional and density functional theory in chemistry. It's so popular uh, in pharmacology, for example, uh, that it got cited, I think, 113,000 times. But since 2017, these guys got cited 132,000 times, and they didn't even bother publishing it anywhere. It's still a preprint on archive because they said, well, we've submitted it to some mathematics magazine and got rejected, but then it got cited more than that entire magazine in its entire history, so what do we really care? Right? So this is still a preprint, uh, and uh, it's awesome, right? So what you get is three matrices as input. Now there is a matrix of questions and those contain embeddings of what the input is. Right? So you've got that word and that word and that word and that word. They're embedded as vectors. A bunch of vectors is a matrix. All right? So we've got then the key matrix and that's the context. Since we do have inner product on this space, the overlap between the question and the context would be the relevance of the question within the context. So we've got the query vectors, so one vector per word 
of the input and that's the question being asked. Then we've got the key vectors, again arranged as a matrix, uh, and that is the basis set of contexts within the embedding, right? If we're talking about science, it will be one vector. If we're talking about food, it would be a very different vector that is orthogonal to different sets of vectors in our input space. So that determines the relevance of the query. And then, of course, this QK transpose is just an inner product. It's a chunk of the Frobenius inner product on the matrix space. It is literally the inner product of every vector in the query and every vector in the key matrix. And the result is just a bunch of overlaps. And then that is just normalization to keep the numerical precision happy. Softmax is moderation, it just shaves off uh, the elements that are too big. And then what that ultimately is, is a matrix that gets multiplied into the value matrix, right? Again, containing the vectors of all possible outputs that this is trained to produce. And so this will then be the coefficients of those outputs. So what goes in is the question, it gets projected onto the contexts and moderated, something is produced and then those coefficients are applied and a linear combination of some answers is returned within that embedding. So you can see it's a question is being evaluated in a context and an answer is being returned on the space of some embeddings. This became known as the attention mechanism. And so if you look inside chat GPT, you will see them repeatedly. So Q and K here into matrix multiplication, then scaled, then masked optionally. Remember that multiplicative memory updates that we had in the LSTM layers, soft max function, then matrix multiplication and onwards. So QKV are these QKVs here. And you would normally want multiple such blocks. This is called multi-headed attention because different attention mechanisms with different values of key matrix might be sensitive to different contexts, right? So you would have multiple heads that are sensitive to multiple different contexts, producing you multiple answers within those contexts, which you can then concatenate and send onwards as a signal to the network. And uh, these inputs can be pre-transformed as well because in some cases, for example, if it's in Fourier domain, it'll just be a bunch of oscillations. But if you Fourier transform it, it'll have nice localized peaks in NMR spectroscopy. So these pre-transformations are trained to expose pertinent characteristics of the signal, at least well, this is what what we hope they do, because a lot of this, of course, is very hard to interpret when you are staring at what a particular matrix is doing. Okay, so you've got your inputs, you've got your embeddings. They also get the position appended to them literally as a number if the words of a language are ordered to keep track of that order. Goes into multi-head attention, goes into standard feed-forward neural networks, the ones that I've just described, and then goes into this block which also contains all of the previous outputs that this network produced so that it sees its own previous outputs when it produces the next token in the output. And so you've got that. Okay, that's literally that. So multi-head attention block, scale dot product attention, and this is what we've just discussed. Uh, and that's an example of a context, right? So in the context of eating, that would be important. In the context of some picture, that would be important, and so on. So queries, uh, keys, and values are once again going here. And this is how transformers work. Notice here, there is now no recurrence. Uh, there are no convolutions, at least explicitly. And um, this is how AlphaFold and ChatGPT are actually working. Apparently, this is very successful, even if the exact reasons why this is so successful might not be terribly obvious to us yet. All of this uh, we use to great effect. And you will train a network today that does uh, some data processing. One important problem that a lot of people are struggling with and a lot of organizations, in fact, is the interpretability. Think about this architecture. 
So we've got these signals being passed on literally as vectors. What would happen if I just permute the two elements of this vector? So I put this one first and that one second, and I do the corresponding permutation here. So that and that are self-consistently permuted so that the signal is still passed, right? So the permutation that is done in this layer is undone by this layer. You would still get the same output, right? because the permutation substantially changed nothing. But of course, there are n factorial permutations. And if you've got 512 elements in here, that's 512 factorial possible permutations, which is astronomical number. And then we start with random weight matrices, so we don't know which of the 512 factorial permutations we've actually landed. And if we want our network to be interpretable, well, it's effectively encrypted because we don't know which permutation produced that word which you're looking at. And the task of finding out is factorially complex. So fully connected neural networks are actually factorial complexity encrypted. And that's one of the worst complexities there is in computer science. So it's actually impossible to tell what is going on. Very typically in signal processing networks, if you look in these intermediate vectors between the layers, you literally see data goes in, something that looks like random numbers, random numbers, random numbers, random numbers, and then the answer magically comes out. So we don't actually know what the hell is going on inside and we cannot tell because the task is factorially complex. All right, so intermediate signals in fully connected nets are effectively encrypted. If it's convolutional, then convolution stride retains, retains the order somewhat, but for fully connected ones, mm -mm, not a chance. And that, of course, flies in the face of the scientific method, right? Remember what Descartes told us, right? Break every problem into smaller parts, solve simplest problems. Scientific reductionism is about understanding how little bits and pieces work and putting them together. Then, of course, Karl Popper, this is the difference between physics and not physics. If it's not testable, then it's not physics. And so... Um, the way that scientific theories come and go and survive, uh, positivism, um, objective knowledge, right, is again incompatible with this, right? If it's not testable, then it's not science. Even the lawyers got in on the subject, right? There is the famous notorious GDPR, right? There's the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing in the United States that the statement of reasons must be specific and indicate the principal reasons. And of course, if that is not interpretable, then that's a problem. There's a partial solution to that. Uh, when an answer is produced, it turns out to be relatively easy to tell why the answer is produced. You can perturb the input, see how the answer changes, uh, but it is still next to impossible to tell how. So we can tell why the dog is identified as a dog, but we cannot tell how. Question? Um, I was thinking, when you want to try and interpret what the hidden layer means, can't you basically, well, every single time you try to solve it, will it have the hidden layers look the exact same after the outputs? No. Then surely you could solve the same problem a load of times and then kind of compare them and they have to be- Unfortunately not, right? So if every permutation of the intermediate vectors is as good as any other, then you would have uh, essentially 512 factorial equivalent networks in the answer set. And then if you've got multiple such layers, then take a power of that. So there are this almost infinite number of equivalent good enough solutions that would look mathematically completely different. So yeah, that, that, is, that is a serious... Anyway, you want to know more about that? It's in that paper uh, over there. Right. The second thing we need to do is, of course, uncertainty quantification. If we don't know what goes on inside and how the answer is produced, well, we'd better have a measure of certainty. And uh, that uh, can be done using straightforward error propagation right through the Jacobian. Or you could simply train a bunch of neural networks on different databases and look at the extent to which they agree. If your input does not constrain the output, they will all produce different outputs. If your input really does constrain it well, then their outputs will be similar. So you could simply do descriptive statistics on the output. That's an example of a network that determines intermolecular distances. If the data that comes in is good, all 32 networks agree. If the data gets worse uh, on a different sample here that has two distances, you can see they begin to disagree. 
And if the data is really quite challenging, you can see different networks are producing different outputs, but you could still be reasonably certain if you've done this, the average and the standard deviation on this, what is the answer and what is the measure of certainty in that answer. And if you give it completely corrupted input data and you do know the right answer, then if you do some statistics on 32 different networks, you can see that the blue is the average and the red is the standard deviation, right? The standard deviation is as big as the signal. And so you can see here that actually neural networks can fail gracefully and give you an honest measure of certainty that they have. In this case, the data can clearly not be trusted. Okay. How do we build the training databases? And this is again an example from our work, and this in fact is what you will be doing today. So you will be training a simple neural net that takes um, something called uh, a double electron-electron resonance dipolar modulation. Uh, it's a magnetic process that is distance sensitive in molecules, and you would be reconstructing distance distributions that made that possible. Now, we have a network there with a couple of million parameters. Of course, we need, in order to constrain those parameters, well, a couple of billion question-answer pairs. Typically, we use 10 to the 10 question-answer pairs. There is absolutely no way nobody would ever be able to produce 10 to the 10 instances of experimental magnetic resonance data. Not a bloody chance, right? For image recognition, yes, the internet, the great big internet, might contain a billion images by now, or we've written enough nonsense and put it online that large language models can be trained. We have not created enough nonsense in physics by a long mile to be able to train pretty much anything. And so what needs to be done is you need to generate the training databases by extremely high quality simulations. So the data has to be reproduced very precisely. You get all the physics in, but not only the physics, you get all the instrumental artifacts, all of the correctly colored noise, all of the distortions in the output that can be produced if there's some temperature variation across your sample and so on. So if you model your data extremely precisely down to everything that can possibly go wrong, then you can actually generate a realistic training database and this is how these are done. So the networks are trained on this giant collection of simulated data and then we get the data from a real protein Conventionally, such problems are really hard to solve. In this case, the transformation is vaguely related to the inverse Laplace transform, so ill-posed and unstable, and neural networks do it really well. And of course, even the overtraining problem disappears because the database here is effectively infinite, right? So we can just continue throwing new batches at the training network until it's actually converged on the norm of the gradient and not just, yes, Ah, but the simulation's forward. So the forward problem, if you know the distance distribution, you can easily predict what this data is going to look like. But the backward simulation is hard and stable and ill-posed. So it's going backward. That is hard, of course. We only need to go forward for the training database, and then the network allows us to go backward. So this is why. And in a lot of cases, right, uh, building, predicting how some quantum device is going to behave is quite easy. Now you've measured how it behaves and what the hell just happened, right? Extracting the Hamiltonian parameters, that's hard. Right? That, that is it. Example from, again, an, another paper that came out a couple of weeks ago uh, from my lab, uh, magnetic resonance data. To acquire a single data set, there is 48 hours to assign and label it is two weeks. It's absolutely not a chance that we can do several million of these things. Uh, but uh, we have very high quality simulators that produce them in reasonable time. And this is how those data sets look. So that's a typical protein, ubiquitin. That's a three-dimensional NMR spectrum. That's a high-resolution two-dimensional NMR spectrum. But here, these are frequencies of nuclear induction signals that come into our coils in the magnet. But look at the digitization here. We've got maybe a thousand pixels here by a thousand pixels. And here, it's at least 512 by 512 by 512. So if we estimate the amount of storage 
that is needed for that for very high resolution data 1024 by 248 by 256 in three dimensions real and imaginary it is a complex data eight bytes uh, per data point double precision so that's 16 gigabytes and of course if you need a million of them that's 16 petabytes that's an awful lot of petabytes Right? And still impossible to store. And so you have to play various games around tensor structure decompositions and on-the-fly generation storage of that data. So again, I've given you the link where all of that is discussed. And then once you've managed to train it, you can do all sorts of beautiful things. Right? This is something that came out in Photoshop a few months ago. If you have a picture, right? so that's the central part, that's the picture you took, you can say, okay, Photoshop expand, and then it expands something, it into something that wasn't originally there, but logically matches what you can have. Or if you no longer uh, like that bloke, you can just airbrush him out uh, and tell Photoshop, well, okay, put some ocean over there. I no longer like this chap no more. And so it will paint in the missing pixels is what is important. But of course, a lot of scientific data processing is about painting in the missing pixels. If you've got some sparse sampling, if you've got uh, some very careful engineered uh, measurement process, then you are painting in the missing pixels. And in these two papers, uh, these two chaps, uh, Gogulan and Fleming, have designed a neural network that looks at scientific data, NMR in this case, and literally paints in the missing pixels. Or you can, you know, paint extra pair of ears on your dog and they were able to do, uh, for example, dynamical decoupling on their spin system by image processing rather than any kind of physics. So take a look at those papers. You can sometimes receive distorted data, but the data is distorted in a very well-defined way. You can train a neural network that would undistort it back to what there was supposed to have been, and that's in these two papers. Uh, these two chaps have designed uh, such networks. Yes? Is that, does that work similarly to the networks that can, like, say, remove watermarks or that kind of thing? Pretty much, yeah. So it's uh, any two-dimensional NMR spectrum is substantially just an image. It's not 256, 256, 256. Our RGB, right, it's a different dynamic width, different number of channels, so real and imaginary, so two color channels and higher dynamic widths. But substantially the task of removing a distortion from an image is mathematically isomorphic to the task of removing a distortion from some physical science spectroscopy data set. Uh, another example from magnetic resonance, we do have, so that's a schematic of a protein backbone with all the atoms in there. Our typical protein structure determination experiments in magnetic resonance, they involve data sets like this, where we have a sequence of amino acids and a sequence of signals which correspond to carbons that are close together on the protein backbone. I will not bore you with the details, save to say that, that this is singularly tedious and it takes weeks, right? Uh, doing signal by signal assignment of protein and MR spectra. But of course, you can train a neural network to, for example, locate these signals uh, so that you don't have to click. And secondly, if you make these signals specific to each amino acid, then you can train a network that does image recognition and actually identifies uh, that amino acid. And uh, finally, I think that's the last slide or thereabouts before the conclusions. This is what you're going to be doing today. Uh, DearNet, so the network that processes the dipole spectroscopy data, vector goes in through a bunch of fully connected layers. We need an extra specialized layer because the output has the physical meaning of a probability density, so you have to normalize it so that it sums to one, and then literally the regression layers, and that's the team uh, here in Southampton and in Zurich uh, that was responsible for that, and it does beautiful data processing. So that's the time domain uh, modulation data, and that's the distance domain probability density of the corresponding distance, and the pr process from here to here is really difficult and unstable, and we realized that neural networks do that very well. Okay, so summary, where all of this is going, you've seen, of course, uh, some years ago, uh, 
uh, repeated claim on television that no artificial intelligence can ever replace human creativity, you know, artistry, poetry, and so on. The first thing it replaced was human creativity, artistry, and poetry. That's me uh, telling ChatGPT, because I needed to write a grant application, I say, take Ivar Fred Holmes as a German mathematician and reimagine him as a Terminator. This is what it has produced, except it cropped the picture a little bit low, so I didn't have this space. So I loaded it in Photoshop, and I said, Photoshop, extend me the, the canvas. Uh, with, uh, with the charcoal in it, and it did it, so now I have some space to put the title around it. Of course, the first entity in history that lost its job uh, to artificial intelligence was Tom the Cat, uh, when uh, the, the fit lady has got a robotic cat which made short work of Jerry, uh, and that was the entire tragedy of that particular cartoon. Uh, your essays are, of course, now done, but more importantly, my lecture notes too. Right. So it is really good uh, in producing LaTeX lecture notes on, on short prompts. Uh, it has outdone uh, a few PhD students in my group already in designing a particular quantum mechanical extension of a hydrodynamic solver, which we ended up actually programming in uh, and using. And then that's the summary in one of these papers, right? So for centuries, the philosophical approach to science has been to find the fundamental laws and to use them. But neural networks are complete black boxes, right? So we don't know how they work. We don't know why they produce an answer, but we don't know how, right? And so, well, it can write you a haiku uh, and, and so on. So, well, uh, it works. Uh, unlike quantum computing, uh, uh, artificial intelligence works. So at least one half of the hype that you see in the newspapers is worth the while, but you'd better know your linear algebra. Uh, neural networks themselves are easy. You've just had a crash course. You've seen it's all the same matrix vector products everywhere, but training databases can be stupidly hard to design. This is the entire network that does DeerNet, right? So MATLAB is beautiful. You can literally just concatenate them one after the other and then tell it to train. Uh, NMR spectroscopy in particular, and a lot of other spectroscopies and a lot of uh, photonics is a giant image analysis problem, right? You'd better have an uncertainty estimate for everything that it produces, but that's straightforward. Uh, you will need in the training database design to also model the artifacts of your instrument, otherwise the network will misinterpret them. Uh, so it has to be prepared to encounter everything that goes wrong as well as everything that goes right. So in the training database you will generate today, you will see that noise and distortions are being deliberately applied. Uh, it's not relevant to this cohort because you already have your PhDs, but uh, we can recruit more and probably will. And that's it. <laughs>